potential amplification and its potential signaling. Now, the reason, first we have to understand why we do differential signaling. And to understand that, let me just give you a hypothetical but relatively common scenario that can happen in integrated circuits. Nowadays, you can have, I mean, most commonly, you have mixed, mixed signal circuits in ICs, which basically contain elements that are digital and elements that are analog. So, for instance, uh, an audio chip, a HD to a a lot of communication circuits used for wireless communication. All of them contain a lot of analog and digital signals. Now, that's one situation where you can run actually into a case where you have a line, let's say a metal line on the chip, that's carrying a clock. So let's say for the type of argument. Just I'm making it one simple scenario, but as you can see, this is quite general. And then you have another line that could be close by that's carrying a sensitive analog signal. Right? And these two lines could couple into each other, right? Because if they're close by, they could both electrically and magnetically couple. But electrically, you can model it as a bunch of capacitors coupling these. And magnetically, there would be some inductance, inductance, and the mutual inductance, and so on and so forth. So what is the impact of this? Let's say this is the source. So let's say you have some sort of analog signal source and some digital clock driver. And then at the destination, you are driving some sort of load, and you want to see what comes out. Well, the problem is that, well, if there's a little bit of perturbation on the digital signal due to the analog one, it's not going to be a big deal. The digital is one and zero, and you have this margin, this kind of noise margin, that allows you to, uh, to accommodate for that. And that's a good thing about digital. But on, on the contrary, if you come back and look at the analog signal that comes back, comes out of the side, you will may see these little kind of spikes on it, which happen during the time where you have a transition in the digital signal. Well, I'm trying to create that situation as accurate as I can. So now on top of your desired signal, you have these things, which can be quite disruptive, right? Because for instance, if it's an audio signal, then that's an extra component of it. I mean, it has multiple frequency components. And that comes in and disturbs it, and if you hear this, for instance, you may hear this hum, or this is all sorts of interesting things. I actually remember, I, uh, a while back, I had a computer whose clock frequency was, I think, 100 megahertz. It's CPU clock frequency. And this was the state of the old. <coughs> so whenever I ran a kind of piece of music on it, like I played a wave or something on this, I could hear it on the FM radio. Few rooms down the hall at 100 megahertz. So somehow inside these things coupled to each other and then you could hear it all the way out there. It was strong enough to be translating over several rooms. So my point is that particularly if this is this point the signal is sensitive, this is a bad effect. This is something you want to avoid. Well, so how do we avoid that? There are several ways. What is the simplest way that comes to mind to avoid this? Low-pass filter. Yes, but if what? Well, think about it. Low-pass filter works only if this component is out of band with respect to that. So if it has the in-band component, so let's say if you have a kind of impulse train like that, you have a series of impulses in frequency limit, right? And this is the your signal, desired signal. So even if you low-pass filter there on a little brick wall filter, right? You throw away these guys, right? There are still in the, if there's an in-band component, the low-pass filter cannot get rid of it. It gets rid of the out-of-band components. It may work for certain cases, but oh, but and the other thing is that making a low-pass filter, particularly a low-frequency one on chip, is quite challenging. But there are ways. I mean, there are, there are ways to make it, but if you want to make it out of passive components, it becomes extremely large. So you have to do other things. There are other ways of doing it using gyrators and things of that sort, and we may towards the end of it next quarter, we may talk a little bit about those, but not, so, so low pass filter may work to some extent, but not a whole lot, and it's kind of challenging because in, in every line, of uh, every line, you need some sort of low pass filter like that. What else can you do? Short your lines or make them far apart? Yeah, that's a good, good idea, right? And so why should I place them right next to each other, right? And so if I have a chip like that, and this is a digital line, make sure that my analog lines are on this side. That works up to a certain point, right? But it only alleviates the problem, it doesn't eliminate it. And the other thing is that that makes me very, that makes my layout job of the whole chip quite challenging because if I need a clock down here, 
how would I get it there without having an overlap with this line? Right? So you can see in practice, in a large chip, it becomes very difficult to achieve that. But nonetheless, you have to always think about where to put the analog and digital. So if you look at some of the modern one mixed signal chips, you always see that the digital is on one side, and the analog is on one side, and the most sensitive parts are in this corner that's the farthest away from the digital.
terms of this, these are close and these are close and this is, these are far apart pairs, are far apart from each other, then the spikes generate substantially reducing amplitude. So I can not only make the signal differential, but I can also make my perturbation differential. And that is added. You know, and whenever, and whenever you have a problem with perturbation, noise, and all those things, there are two general ways to deal with that. One is by reducing the transfer function. Well, in general, three ways, sorry, three ways. One is by reducing, lowering your transfer function size. The other one is by lowering your sensitivity. And the third one is by, lo by lowering the amount of interference you generate. So whenever you, you have this perturbation problem, you have to think about where are these three elements, where these three elements are, and how I can play with them. So in this example, separating them, making them, placing them as far apart as possible, that's reducing the transfer function. Making this differential is reducing this one way of reducing the sensitivity. And making these differentials one way of reducing the amount of perturbation you generate to begin with. Okay. So, this I could make differential and this I could make differential. So, now let's go back to the case where I have only the, let's say, the signal is differential. Now, if I look at these individual <coughs> signals, though, if I look at one, one of them at a time, I see the spikes quite large, right? And I show them like this, but they could be like this, depending on how. From the couplet is and how weak the signal is. And that looks a lot worse. Right? So, what kind of the system that, that does the subtraction? What ideally do I want to see from that? What do I want it to do? Well, how can I make this? So, let's say I want to amplify, kind of this, have this differential signal. If I were to amplify this differential signal, what do I do? Well, the easiest way is to use two amplifiers, right? I could make an amplifier here and make an amplifier here. Let's say this is a common emitter. Each one of them is a basic common emitter. V and V out. But if I do that, what does it do? Well, how do I get the difference? I can look at the difference of these two somehow, right? And apply it to another pair of these. And use that to amplify. But the problem, what is the problem with doing it just like that? The perturbation goes through these amplifiers, right? These individual amplifiers have no way of knowing that there's another amplifier. So this perturbation, this kind of undesirable signal, has to go through this guy and get completely perfectly amplified for it to be canceled at the end, right? And that means that my this signal that I would call the common mode, because it's common between the two of them. It's the same gain, has the same gain as my, my differential signal, which is my desired signal. Right? That was how we got the separation. If I do it this way, I get the same gain for my differential as well as my uh, common mode signal. Differential is the difference, and common mode is common. And we'll define them more carefully in a second. But just, so that's what it is. So, what do I need ideally? Define the ideal amplifier that's good to have here. If I were to make instead of two amplifiers, go to one big box and have two inputs and two outputs. What do you want that to do, ideally? Well, of course, you want it to amplify the differential signal, right? That's for sure. What do you want it to do to the, to the common mode signal? Reject it. Attenuate it, right? Or give it less gain, at least, than this differential signal. So the lower the gain of the common mode, so if you can somehow discern between the differential part and the common mode part, and attenuate the common mode part, or let's say completely reject it, as you said, and then amplify the common mode, the differential part. That would be a good thing, because at the output, then I won't have these spikes if I could somehow do that. And the amplifiers I showed, if you just make it out of two amplifiers in pair, so if I make that box out of something like this, these are two inputs and those are two outputs, it won't do that, right? Because it can't, each one of them cannot discern whether it's differential or common mode, and it will just amplify everything. So I need something that can attenuate my common mode. Now I need to modify this stage. So let's look at this stage carefully and see how we can modify in such a way to give us an attenuation. So let's say I want to have two of these. Right? So I have two single input amplifiers, say like that, BCC, some RC, and I draw the other one in a kind of symmetric way. So let's call this V in plus, V in minus, V O plus. 
plus V O or minus. Okay? So this this is a two input, two output box, right? So this is that answer what I'm talking about, but it still doesn't reject the common mode signal. It has the same gain for the common mode as well as the differential. So to get a constant so to get a constant gain or a lower gain for common mode, I have to see how the common mode behaves. So in terms of voltage, if I thought that a higher voltage is kind of moving up and a lower voltage is moving down, how would the differential of common mode look like in every part like that, as they, at the input? So a purely differential signal, differential signal would look like this, right? Because when one side goes up, the other side goes down. It's anti-symmetrical. Purely differential signal is like that, the definition, right? Now, how would the common mode signal look like?
retrospect, this is a genius idea. <clears throat> What's the history behind it? Uh, this actually started from vacuum tubes. That they did it exactly for the same purpose. They wanted to kind of get rid of the uh, perturbations and uh, interference. And this was a way, good way of attenuating that. And, and basically they made it out of uh, three trials the first time. You can actually make differential vacuum. So you can actually get the, good, the interesting thing about the vacuum tube is that since this terminal is shared, right? This would be your anode. I'm sorry, I'm saying yeah, this is your cathode, not your anode. This is your cathode. So you can have a shared cathode. And you can have two sets of grids on both sides. So you can make it a semi-circular thing, right? So if you look at the, think about it this way. If you if you make this, this is your if this is your cathode inside, and this is your anode. So this is basically like a collector here and emitter. Right? You can have a grid halfway through here and another grid halfway through. So you can make a single tube that does the job of all transistors for this purpose. And then you can have a second one that works as a transistor, as, as a current source. And the, the truth of the matter is that you don't even need a current source here. Right? You, you can use, as, as long as this impedance is high, the variation in the common mode will be low. So in reality, there's always some resistance RPE here. Yeah. And that makes it a, have a little bit of a common gain, common mode gain, but not a whole lot. Let's see what happens. If there is a resistor here, so if I start changing this up, moving this up and down, this node moves up and down, so there will be a little bit of extra current. So as the, but this current, this resistor is large. So the change in the current is small, so the variation at the output is small. But now if I apply a differential signal, all of a sudden there will be large variation because now all the current is skewed to one side or the other. But again, we'll take that into, our, into account when we do our calculations later on. We'll see it kind of But it started basically from vacuum tubes. Quite frankly, I don't know who invented the uh, differential pair. I don't think it's a well known thing. I think it was like 1930s or something. No, it was before that. Before. It was before 1930s. Uh, there are some papers that I've seen that use vacuum tubes back in the early 20s and all that. But um, I don't know who invented it. Um, yeah, it's actually one of the, one of the most important building blocks in integrated circuits. An interesting thing is that you can have all sorts of differential pairs. This is one area, I mean, you can have different topologies turn differential. We will play, play that game a little later too. So it's not just this topology that we can be, you know, do what we expect. Okay, any other questions about this? Alright, so now the question, what I did, I kind of divided my signal into two completely isolated cases, right? Two extreme cases. Well, if it's completely differential, it's one thing, and if it's completely common mode, it's another thing. But in general, my signal could be V1 and V2, right? So in the most general case, these two voltages could be two independent voltages. Now, what about that case? What happens in that case? Well, the interesting thing is that, so if I think about two independent voltage sources, V1 and V2, right? I claim I can take any pair of two voltages and decompose it as a sum of differential component and a common voltage. How would I do that? Well, I claim that I can replace this with the differential part. So let's call this VID over 2. And this is minus VID over 2, which makes a differential, a differential voltage of VID, right? And then a VIC, which is a common mode, that's shared by both. Now the question of what are these two quantities? Well, I claim VIC, and you can easily show VIC is V1 plus V2 over 2, the average of the two. And VID is the difference. Right? And it's easy to see that, right? Because this voltage, with respect to ground, this is VIC plus VID over 2. So if you do that, then basically you will see that VIC is that V1 plus V2 over 2. That would be plus V1 minus V2 over 2. So these guys cancel, so you're you left with V1. And the same thing for the other one. It's a minus sign on the other side, so that becomes A. That becomes V2. So any two pairs of voltages can be decomposed as a differential and common voltage component. Does that mean that my analysis is completely valid the way I described it with these two? Well, 
Well, I'm implicitly assuming superposition. I'm assuming that the sum of the effects of these sources is equal to the sum of the individual effects, right? And that's true only <coughs> when. What is the condition for superposition to hold? In every case, any case, any, not just circuits, electromagnetics, you know, linear system. Linear system. Mm -hmm. So the system has to be linear. Not time invariant, actually. Time invariant is not a necessary condition. Just linear. Uh, but if this system were linear, then this would hold. But this system is not linear. You know where you are it's not linear, right? So in general, if I I can always write my input signal like that, but I can't say the sum of the effects is the, 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 the sum of the individual responses in general. However, if this inputs, these inputs are small, I can write this equivalent small signal model, and for that, since that's linear, for small signal model, for small perturbation, I can decompose it in those two components. So that's one thing to know. Now, but other than that, the question, let's start with the general nonlinear response of the system. You see, see if we can derive. So let's go back to the same differential pair. And what I'm interested in is right now is let's say there are some resistors <coughs> there. And the value of this resistor is important in the sense that if you make this resistor too large, then this voltage will be too small at the bias point, and then that can drive this transistor into saturation. So you've got to be careful. Those two, those two resistors can be, can't be too large. But let's say I have some IBE here. And then I have, let's for now, let's assume that I only have a differential, a differential signal. So I have a differential signal, VID, and somehow I provide enough a, a, a right common mode voltage so I have enough DC current. So don't worry about that. So I maintain it somehow. So I have a VID here applied to this transistor. So let's call this IC1 and this is IC2. I want to see if I can derive the general large signal transfer function of the signal. In other words, I want to see if I can write, more interestingly, for differential output, I want to see if I can write delta IC which is defined as IC1 minus IC2, the difference of the two output currents first, in terms, in, as a function of the ID. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to write delta VIC, delta IC as a function of the ID. And when I do that, then I can actually rewrite the VOD, the output voltage, <coughs> as a function of the ID. Actually, this should be capital VID, because these are large. Okay? So let's, let's see if we can do that. So how can we do it? Well, what do I know about the current IC1 and IC2? What can I say about their sum? I, well, I'm interested in their difference, but let's look at their sum first. What can you see about, say about that? It's always equal to the current source. Uh, yes, the minor correction term. Uh, Correct. Because so that's the inner current, this is the collective current, right? So that's the exact current. So that, that I agree. You, you guys agree with me. Right? So the sum of these two currents is alpha times i. Now, the other interesting thing I, I see is that the difference between the two VBEs, so this is VBE1, right? And this is VBE2. So VID is nothing, so VID is VBE1 minus VBE2. But I know how to write my VBE in terms of IC, right? It's an exponential dependence, right? So for VID in terms of the IC, it will be the log dependence. So I know, I know IC is IS E to VBE over VT, right? So in, in other words, I can write the VT natural log of IC1 over IS minus VT natural log of IC2 over IS. Now, here I'm assuming that the two transistors are identical. And therefore, they have the same IS. Now, if they have the same IS, what is the difference? What is the log of x minus log of y? Vt and then IC1 over IC2. Exactly, it's the ratio, right? So it's Vt ln of IC1 over IC2. Or, in other words, IC1 over IC2 is uh, Vt, uh, I'm sorry, is E2 Vid, the input differential voltage, divided by the thermal voltage. So the ratio, I know the ratio of the two currents, and I know their sum. So I have two equations and two unknowns. This guy, equation number one, and this guy, equation number two. So I should be able to 
solve for IC1 and IC2, and hence for the, their difference. Solving for IC1 and IC2 is relatively easy, right? So you look, I look at this and say, well, IC1, I can factor IC1 out of this. So if I factor it out, the IC1 plus IC2 over IC1 is alpha IE. But I know what this ratio is, right? That ratio is 1 over that ratio, so it's basically 1 plus E2 minus BID over BT. IC1, that's alpha IE. Therefore, IC1 itself is going to be alpha IE divided by 1 plus E2 minus BID divided by BT. Right? Agree? So, simple algebra. Now, how about IC2? Well, I can do it the same thing. And when I do that, I see it's the same thing except for the fact that I don't have this minus sign. It's alpha IE divided by 1 plus E2 plus the ID. So I have a solution for IC1 and IC2. And as you can see right, right from here, based back to your question earlier, this never goes to alpha IE completely. But if the IE is substantially larger than the T, the 25 millivolts, this exponential can become small enough that this becomes a complete IE, or this becomes large enough that this becomes zero. Almost zero for our practical purposes. Now, I'm one step away from what I wanted to calculate, which was delta IC. Because I want to see the transfer function between the differential input voltage and the differential output current. So for that, actually I have to subtract this two, right, by definition. So if I do that, delta IC, by definition, IC1 minus IC2, so I have alpha IEE -E here. And then the terms I have is 1 over this guy minus 1 over that guy. So it's 1 over 1 plus E2. Let's just show it as minus something. You know what it is, VID over VT. Uh, minus 1 over 1 plus E2 plus that thing. Okay? So I have to look at that. Now, well, let's just write that VID. So I have to calculate this. One way to calculate this is to factor half of this out from both sides. So I can rewrite this as alpha IEE -E times. Now, on this side, I factor E2 minus VID over 2VT. That's half of that, right? And what is left behind, this gives me a positive plus term of the same size. Cancel that to give you a 1. And that gives you uh, half, the remaining half. Right? I'm trying to make it more symmetrical, basically. And I can play the same game with the other one. So that's this part. That would be minus, uh, for the second part I have, I'm going to write it here, 1 over, so I'm going to factor half of that. So I get like E2, DID plus DID, 2VT times this one gives me a negative, this one gives me a positive, so I start with that. So I can write the remaining half, VID over 2VT plus E2 minus VID over 2VT. Right? So it's this difference. But I notice one thing, this term is common. So I can factor that term out of these two fractions, out of the two denominators. So I can rewrite this whole thing as alpha IE over E2 plus VID over 2VT plus E2 minus VID over 2VT. And then what is left from this guy is 1 over E2 minus VID over 2VT. And that from that one is the plus term. So I need to find a common denominator. What is the common denominator between these two? One. One, exactly. Right? It's the product of two. So then what is left is this guy here minus that guy there. So this whole thing becomes e to the plus minus e to the minus. Divided by e to the plus plus e to the minus. 
Basically, it becomes e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by e to the x plus e to the minus x. What is that? What is this? e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by e to the x. You have a way of writing that in a shorter notation for that. Hyperbolic yeah. tangent, yeah. but exactly. This is, not, this is twice the hyperbolic sign, and this is twice the hyperbolic also. Because the hyperbolic. So this becomes, this whole thing you can write as alpha IEE and hyperbolic of DID over 2 dt. So follow me right here. Delta IC is alpha IE. So I found a transfer function. It's a nonlinear transfer function generally, kind of large signal thing. And that's what it looks like, right? So how does it behave? What kind of behavior does it have?
what is the derivative of hyperbolic tangent? Well, I kind of remember it, but if you don't, you can do all, you can always do this, right? And what is the derivative of this? How do you capture the derivative of a fraction? Bottom times the derivative of the top minus top times the derivative. Exactly. So bottom times the derivative of the top. Now what is the derivative of the top? This one remains the same. This one gives you a minus sign. So it becomes the same thing as bottom. Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is x minus x times same thing again, because this gives you a minus sign. And divided by bottom squared, right? Fair? Okay. So, what is it? Well, it is what it is, right? This is what, what it is. But now, uh, let's, where do I want to evaluate? So, is this derivative? This is a general expression. But I want to have my gain. So this basically gives me the slope of the slide, right? It goes with an RC. But which slope would you capitalize as your gain? This slope or that slope or that slope? The center of the operation. Yeah. So we kind of, by definition, we look at this point where the stage is balanced already. And say, well, if I perturb it a little bit from the balanced stage, how much gain do I get? Because that's where I ideally want to be. That's where I have the most range in both directions. So that, and that happens to be the maximum gain anyway. Right? So, so I have evaluated this at DID equals 0. In other words, I have evaluated this at, at x equals 0. So what is it? So it's 1 plus 1 squared minus um, what? Minus, 1 minus 1 0 divided by 1 plus 1 squared gives you which one? Okay. So the derivative of the tan, tan x, tan hx, is 1. But the derivative of what is left, so there, there's an argument there, so I have to take that into account. So it's alpha, let's say minus rc, alpha i e. Um, now, I have also calculated the derivative of the argument. And multiply by that one, right? So it's the derivative of this times the derivative of the other, which is which gives me what? Which gives me two bt, right? And then it gives me a one. The rest gives me one. So what is this quantity? This quantity. What is alpha i e? It's the sum of the two collector parts, right? So if, if let's say let's say for a second the stage is balanced, it's basically twice the collector current. So what is two alpha e divided by two? It's the collector current of individual transistors. So each one of the transistors that's the collector current, right? Because half of it goes one way, half of it goes the other way. If it's balanced. So this is I C, right? Correct. Now if that's I C, what is this? GM. GM. So what is this? Minus GM RC. That's similar to the gain of what? The common emitter, right? It shouldn't be that surprising because we made it out of common emitters. And it shouldn't be surprising if I will see later on that it behaves exactly like a common emitter for the differential signal. So if this were this was a common emitter now, and it behaves like a common emitter, if I want to extend this linear range, right? So if the, let's say this is too steep for me, and I want something that looks more like that, how do I achieve that? From design, how do I modify from that stage? Yes, where would I put the emitter? Let's go here. Let's quick look at it. Side. Where to put the resistance? So where would you put the resistance? Above the current source. Here? Okay. Let me ask you, what is a current source in series with a resistor? What is a current source in series with anything other than a current source? Well, it's not 
No, it's a card source. A card source in series with anything is a card source. The same thing <coughs> as the voltage source in parallel. An ideal voltage source in parallel with anything is a voltage source, except unless it's another voltage source. So if this were an ideal current source, if I put it there, it does nothing.
minus half the other. Okay. Now, I'm pushing this side up by the same amount that I'm pulling this down. And I have two resistors in the feet of equal size. Okay. What can I say about this middle node? Two R E 
E is impaired, I'll give you an RE, RE, right? So this is exactly the same thing. Now I can actually have my axis of symmetry go through without a problem. But now, let me ask you a question about this. Which way would this current go? From left to right or right to left? So uh, let me ask you this. How many of you think that it's going from left to right? How many of you think it's going from right to left? Oh, it's obvious, right? So if you tell me that it's going from left to right, I say, well, look at it in the mirror, and it will be going from right to left. And therefore, the only answer that's valid for both of them is zero. So there's no current. Under no circumstances, for as long as they have a common mode signal, there's no current for it. So what does it tell me about this wire here? It's inconsequential. It doesn't matter. So I can remove it. There's no current in it anyway. Again, I managed to break my circuit into two equivalent half circuits. But now, this output is also VOC, right? This is the output common mode voltage. Same thing is here, VOC. Now, I want to calculate my common mode gain. What is my common mode gain? So, A, B, C. By definition, it's V, O, C over V, I, C. Which is what now? I can calculate it on one side, right? What is the gain of this common emitter with emitted degeneration? The rule, right? The, the simple rule. GM, R, C over... Yeah, but you're saying that funny thing, right? I, mean, so I, I told you, I gave you an easy way. Total resistance here divided by total resistance. That, that's another way of saying the same thing. So in that case, it would be RC, well, alpha RC, divided by alpha RF plus 2 RED, which as you pointed out, you can also write as minus GM RC divided by 1 plus 2 GM RE. So, what is it compared to the differential gain, the common mode gain in this case? It's much larger, right? I would say much smaller. The gain is much smaller. How much smaller? One plus two, exactly by one plus two GMRE. So the larger this output resistance is, in other words, the closer this is to an ideal current source, the smaller your common mode gain would be as we expected it from the qualitative discussion we had earlier. And in fact, if this, is an, if this were an ideal current source, it means that RE is infinite, therefore this becomes infinite, this whole thing becomes zero. So the common mode signal is no gain whatsoever. Now, there is a quantity that's quite useful, which basically want it to be as large as possible, which is called the common mode rejection ratio. The common mode rejection ratio is that defined as the ratio of the differential gain to the common mode gain. Right? And ideally you want this to be infinite, but in reality you want it to be as large as possible. But that tells you how much of this common mode signal gets attenuated when it goes through the second stage. And that's basically, as you can see, it's basically 1 plus 2 gm RE. So the better this current source is, the higher your common mode projection ratio will be. Any questions? If there are no questions, let's uh, take a quick break here, and uh, what we'll do, we will uh, continue our discussion after we come.